All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for everybody for submitting your images. Um, I think I was able to use everybody's today. And if I missed anybody, sorry. Um, I think I did just see some come in that I wasn't able to um, download and add. Maybe I can save those for the next one. Um, so we're gonna do it like we did last time where I'll just open up my uh, the picture viewer and we'll just kind of scroll through. Um, feel free to jump in and uh, ask questions if you have any. Uh, all right, so let me get this uh, photo thing shared and Okay. Everybody can see that all right? I hope so. Nobody's saying anything. <laughs> looks uh, So, uh, first one here, I, I think a lot of you guys will have seen this or at least something close to it. Um, you can see this has a brownish top here. It has uh, what we would call decurrent gills. So that means that they're running down the stipe. Um, actually, let's see, this is from Claudine. Uh, Claudine, are, do you happen to be on? Okay, I guess Claudine's not in yet. Hopefully I'll notice if she joins. Um, so anyway, this, uh, if you aren't aware, is an oyster mushroom. Uh, it's getting cooler outside. So, and with this brown coloration, this is probably the proper uh, Pleurotus ostriatus oyster mushroom. Um, you may remember some of the ones we had earlier, like um, uh, I believe Populinus, and there's a couple of different more white colored oysters. They are edibles. Um, some believe that these are probably the more flavorful of some of the oyster mushrooms you can find out in the woods. Okay, I need to go. I can't. Okay, for some reason it's not letting me advance the pictures. All right, is it still shared? Yeah, it's still shared, it's, but it didn't move. Did it switch? No, not yet. Your screen sharing is paused. Sorry about this, guys. This did not do this last time. No worries. Stop and start again. Is that better? Back to the oyster? On to the picnic oars? OK, it, it progressed now. Awesome. Cool. Um, so this is a nice bright colored mushroom. Um, if you're unaware, uh, polypores, this is a type of polypore. They tend to grow on wood. They tend to be quite um, tough and fibrous. Um, we're gonna see another polypore that we actually enjoy eating a little bit later on. This one's not necessarily edible, but it's a nice color. Um, they're always really orange like this. There's a couple of different species. Um, I learned this one as Pycnoporus, but I believe they now put it back into the genus Tremedes, which is the same genus as the turkey tail. Um, so this is probably Pycnoporus cinnabarinus. There's another one, I think Sanguinius, and I was kind of trying to see if I could determine which is which, and they say that the Sanguinius tends to be thinner. Um, so it, it when we're doing these photo IDs, it's a little tough to see how thick it was. 
And also polypores as they grow tend to, to grow out and thin out as the, the edge, the leading edge grows out. Um, so it's a little hard to get it to species, um, but this is a, a Pycnopores or Trimedes now. Uh, apparently that you can't use that in dyeing, dye making, even though it is this beautiful bright color. Okay, so here is a, um, here's a little oyster looking one, kind of looks similar to uh, the oyster we were looking at. Uh, there are a couple of differences though. This one is more gray and um, this is, was still from Claudine and she had suggested it was very tough, thought maybe it was a crepidotus and a crepidotus is kind of a smaller looking oyster shelf, little, you know, gilled mushroom like this, except it has brown uh, spores. And I said, well, this could be a couple of things. So if we were to zoom in here and take a look at the gills, I, I had a hard time finding some, but if you look right here, you can see there are some serrations on these gills. Look here. Can you guys see my cursor, right? As I'm pointing? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Cool. So um, you can see these serrations here. It's kind of, you know, like a serrated knife. This almost immediately leads me to um, uh, lint lintinus or lintinellus. And if this was getting a little bit older, actually, you can kind of see this little dark area down at the base um, where it's attached to the substrate. This is uh, Lentinus ursinus, the bear Lentinus. And they can get fairly big. Um, they're quite bitter, though. You don't want to confuse these with, with oyster mushrooms. And like um, Claudine had mentioned, they, they are tough. And uh, if you were to give it a little nibble and spit it out, you'd find it uh, a little bit acrid, which means, which means it's um, kind of spicy. And I have lost the capability to advance the slide again. Okay, let's see, maybe yeah. I didn't shrink it enough, yep. All right, so this is a relatively common mushroom uh, and they tend to come out around this time of year. So sometimes if you're looking around for hens, you might see this, it's big yellowy orange mushroom. They would have rusty colored spores. Uh, they tend to have a, a, a partial veil or at least a ring or a ring zone, excuse me, on the stipe there. Um, and there's a couple of different species of this. So this general stature with these big, large, yellowy orange caps that are fairly glabrous, meaning smooth, so they're not really scaly um, with a ring and sometimes some, I, I think it's more ju junius, um, junonius has a, has a almost floral smell. Um, this one not, doesn't necessarily, I think this is actually a different species. And I'm saying that because it has, a, you know, a little less substantial stipe on it. The color is a little bit more yellow. Um, I think this is actually Gymnopolis luteus. So it's another in the same genus, but um, I think that may be what this is. And let me zoom all the way out. All right, so as I was mentioning, there's these big yellowy orange mushrooms, but that one was glabrous or smooth. It didn't have any scales on the cap. This one has scales, which is gonna lead you to something totally different. Um, let me zoom in a little bit here. You can see that the gills are kind of a brown coloration. These usually have a brownish to rusty brown spore print. Um, I, I believe they're more brown than the Gymnopolis. But when you see these big yellow scaly guys, that you should, you should think of um, Foliota. They're wood decomposers as well, um, fairly common. I think this is Oravella. Uh, there's, a, there's quite a few different uh, species of Foliota. Um, the the Oravella tends to have more flattened scales, especially as the mushrooms get older. 
when it's younger, they might be poking up a little bit more and then they'll kind of stick to the cap and turn this brownish color. And they're a little wide, more widely spaced. Whereas some of the others that we find like Squarosa and Squarocytes, they have like really, their spines are like poking up off the cap a lot. That one is not an edible. Okay. So we were just looking at the other Gymnopolis and I know I said that it doesn't really have scales. These are not actual true scales. Um, this, after what I just said, would probably make you think, okay, that looks like another foliota. And it does look very similar, but I believe this is actually just the cap cuticle breaking up on the surface of the cap there. And you can see it has a nice ring. The, the, it's, it's very young and so it's immature. So you get this lighter coloration. Um, the spores have not started maturing yet. And so you can't really tell what the spore color is. Um, this is a good view of adnext or adnate Hills, it's kind of notched where they kind of drop towards the cap where it's attached to the stipe. Um, but I believe this one is Big Laughing Jim, uh, Gymnopolis. It used to be Spectabilis, now it's Junonius. Um, at least I believe that's what that is. Okay. You're not going to mention why it's called Big Laughing Jim. <laughs> I guess I could. So this one, uh, this one actually is known to contain um, psilocybin. Some people have speculated it might be a different uh, compound to, that causes hallucinations, um, but I believe it is just psil psilocin and psilocybin. I don't think that. I think they've kind of done chemical analysis and find that that's what's there. It may have other compounds because even other psilocybin mushrooms will have other different psychoactive compounds. And maybe this has a different ratio from, from the typical psilocybe. But anyway, they call it Big Laughing Jim because people would eat these and they would end up, you know, cackling, and carrying on and having a good old time, I guess. I've never actually tried the Gymnopolis. Um, I've, you know, I've heard some people have, and they, they were active. We had a, we had one member who that was the first mushroom he identified. And the final, the final test was, you know, is it psychoactive? And, uh, so he did the field test on himself and decided it was. All right, so this is um, a little, little brown mushroom, not very descript, but uh, over time you start learning what some of these guys look like. And this general kind of egg shape is quite indicative of Coprinus or Coprinellus. Um, these really close gills here. This is a really nice shot of, of the close gills. And they would have started similar to an agaricus that you buy in the grocery store, so like your button mushrooms. And it would start off white, it would go to like a pinkish color, and then it would eventually turn to this blackish. Mm, these are a little blacker than, than agaricus are, are brown. Um, and then some of them, most of them will eventually deliquesce, meaning the, there's enzymes in the cap that will start dissolving it and it'll kind of drip away and, and that's how the spores are distributed. Um, judging by the look of this one, it, it looks like it has a relatively smooth cap surface. Um, this, this really defined egg shape. I believe this is um, Copernopsis Atramentarius, uh, Atramentaria. Uh, this is actually known as the alcohol inky, inky if I've, if I've uh, <laughs> identified this one right. 
so this actually has something, a compound in it that's very similar to antabuse, um, which is what they would give someone who's an alcoholic to try and dissuade them from drinking because it blocks enzymes in your body that break down some of the uh, breakdown components of alcohol and it makes you flushed and feel not well. Um, so you do eat something like this because they are edible, but you can't drink alcohol if you were to eat this mushroom because it'll, uh, it'll kind of mess you up. And get, it's, apparently it's not a very pleasant experience. I also hear this called Tipler's Bane. It fits quite nicely with the theme of our last monthly meeting. <laughs> so these um, are probably going away. I'm surprised uh, there's, there's usually a few stragglers into later into the season, especially if it's been damp. Um, you may have encountered some in the summer uh, it's a really nice view of this smooth hymenium. So it's just kind of like a wavy where the, where the spores are, are produced is the, called the hymenium. And so it's, it's just barely wavy, doesn't look anything like gills. This is, this is our common chanterelle in this area. And so this is called the smooth chanterelle for that reason, um, cantharellus latericius. And so I guess you're noticing I'm, I'm throwing in two shots of some of these things. Well, I've had some folks sending me a couple of pictures and I don't mind kind of glomming these pictures together. So maybe we can start doing that where we'll, we can have a couple of different shots and I'll just glue them together with some software. And that way we, we can zoom in a little closer and maybe see, um, see more features of the mushroom better. All right, well, these guys are happening right now. And uh, if you haven't seen any, um, you know, if you're looking around oak trees, you'll probably see some soon or, you know, depending where you're looking. Uh, this is a very young hen of the woods coming up. I was talking about polypores and how a lot of times they're, they're really tough and membranous, and you know, and, you know, not edible. This is actually a polypore, but it is tender and edible and quite flavorful. They're they're tasty mushrooms. They um, they can come up in abundance, and um, I think there's quite a few coming up right now. They are relatively easy to identify, even for newcomers. This is probably one I would. Uh, recommend learning for newcomers because there's something that does kind of look like it, but once you, you know, get, get the features down a little bit and start learning a little more, it's easy to identify the two, not to mention the one that it might look like won't kill you. It may not taste as good. It may be a little tougher, but um, it, it wouldn't hurt you. And you can, you know, I've, I, I found one that must have been 10, 10 pounds at least. It's like this big and you can get multiple meals out of that. And it, you can dry it, which in my experience is okay, but you can also simmer it down and, and freeze it, which tends to work pretty good too. Mitch, were you referring to the black staining polypore? That is, that's what I was referring to. I, I mean, I could, um, the black staining polypore tends to have a little more yellow coloration. Um, it tends to have larger lobes uh, as opposed to griffola. Um, you can see these are fairly small. This is a young specimen, but um, yeah. So the, the black stain and polypore tends to have much larger lobes and if it gets bruised anywhere, it's not an immediate stain like some boletes. It's um, it's a slow change to like black coloration. Um, whereas griffola tends to be much more brown. Sometimes it can be pale like this. They do say that uh, this mushroom actually has um, melanin. And so if it's in the sun, it'll actually darken over time. 
And mm -hmm. I've actually found one that had a piece of bark that had fallen over half. And when I pulled the bark off, this side was much darker than the side that was covered in the bark with the bark. Mm -hmm. um, so. Also, if you find hen of a woods in the middle of the summer, it's most likely black staining polypore. That's true. Yes. 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 And vice versa. Yeah. If you find if you find black staining polypore this time of year, which nobody does, but nobody mistakes us for black staining polypore, but they 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 don't really and, overlap. Unless they're really young. Yeah. And um, for one mushroom fair. Uh, we had done kind of some scouting in the area to see, and we happened upon an, uh, an area of oaks and there was just hens, 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 hens. There was probably five or six in the area. And I just was like, oh, wow, look at all these hens. And I thought they were all hens until I looked closer. And sure enough, one of the hens was a black staining polypore, just kind of like right there in, it, it wasn't right next to one, but it was under, you know, the same trees. So, so they can come up around the same time, but yes, most of the time, if, if, if you find a hen in the summer, it's not a hen. My neighbor actually did that and cooked it up and was eating it and was like, look, I found a hen. And I was like, actually, that's not a hen. And it was uh, a couple of years ago. And, but anyway, thanks, Matt. Yes. And when you cook it up, the black staining top polypore turns totally black and the hen stays more or less earth tones. I did not know that. I don't know that I've ever cooked the black staining polypore actually. I can confirm that it turns <laughs> lamp black. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> yeah, feel free to jump in. Sometimes I, I blow through these things and, don't, and forget some things. I, I appreciate you guys chiming in. Um, helping out. Okay, if you want to chime in on this one, feel free. So I, how can I describe Russulas? So Russulas tend to be, a lot of times they have a, just a white stalk, kind of looks like a piece of chalk, as you can see in this one. Sometimes they have some coloration, such as on the cap, like maybe some rosy red, or this one has a little bit of yellow. I was, I've, I'm pretty sure I've found this quite a few times and I, I've never put a name on it. So if any of you guys happen to have put a name on it, feel free to chime in. Um, Cause I would call this one of the yellow russulas. Uh, russulas tend to be very brittle. They break like chalk because of their cellular structure. Um, a lot of times they're cap cuticle, meaning like this membrane on the top that kind of contains the color will peel off. And so you can peel that off. In fact, the, the, um, some of the identifying characteristics in the, the Russula guide, they tell you, you know, it peels off halfway to the center or a third of the way to the center. Of course, that seems like it could be subjective and what if it's moisture that day and it happens to peel more or something along those lines. Um, another thing I find odd about this one though is this, these skirting gills, they're just like hanging down like nothing. I don't know if they're just growing like crazy, but usually they have pretty well-defined gills and this one is, just looks a bit odd. I don't know what's happening there. Anybody have any suggestions of what this might be? No, I guess I'll, I guess that's a no. Anyway, it's a russula. And if you're, you're not sure if it's a russula, a lot of times you can either brush the gills or snap that uh, stipe and it'll crack just like chalk. Um, one of the epithets is uh, uh, better kicked than picked. And some people say, if you throw it at a tree, I think David Aurora in his book said, if you throw it in a tree and it explodes, then you probably have a russula. Um, Lactarius can have similar features because they have a similar cellular structure. Um, so they also tend to be brittle and, and snap. Is that if the tree explodes or if the russula explodes? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that be interesting if you were exploding? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so I'm I'm not um, certain on this ID because it is uh, doing something that's not in the books, but we all know that the mushrooms don't read the books and we, we don't know, they don't adhere to all the rules all the time. Um, so let me ask, does anybody have a, uh, by the way, these are Felix mushrooms. I, I forgot to mention, we've moved on to Felix. Felix, are you around? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Um, anybody, what do you guys think this is? This is a fairly common mushroom that we find pretty often. Thick gills, uh, purple gills, white top, usually it can, it can different, you know, taupe, you know, tan. Uh, the, the cap color is very variable. The, Lacaria? The, yes. This is what I think this is. I think this is Lacaria, um, specifically Okra papuria. But one thing that, that confused me is if you look at these gills, they're extremely forked. They're kind of going crazy in here in all this forking. And I was kind of confused and was like, wait, the, the, the Lucaria have uh, uh, forked gills? And so I, I looked in a couple of books and online, nobody mentioned it. Hmm. So nobody mentioned that they have it. And I actually have one later on that I found that of a, a you know, a purpuria. And it, if you look close, it doesn't have forked gills either. So I don't know if, oh, you know, Felix just joined us. <laughs> Felix, we're on your mushrooms, if you can hear me yet. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I think this is okra purpurea. Um, I try and tell everybody, uh, at least I, I try and tell everybody what you got when you sent it, if I know what it is. So hopefully, you know, even if I've gone past a couple of them, you know, you know what they are. And if you have any questions, you know, like if you join a little late and want to know, hey, did you get to this mushroom? It's either send me a, send a chat or whatever, or just say, hey, what was that? Um, anyway, this looks like okra papuria to me. It is isn't edible. Apparently it's not very flavorful, but um, someone said, if you dry them, I think Bill Russell at one of Sequinotas said that he'll take these, dry them. And if you only get a few morels, say that year, uh, you can throw, rehydrate these and throw those in the same pot and they kind of pick up the same flavor. So never tried it, but. All right, this is a lovely picture. Also from Felix. Um, I believe we have had one of these either at the monthly meeting or one of the forays. Um, great dotting on the cap here. This is pretty characteristic of it. If you were to flip this over, it would have like a white pore layer. Um, this is another type of polypore and it is tender. Um, one thing that's kind of cool about this one is the, um, the pores, instead of all being attached to each other, they look like they're attached, but if you were to kind of turn them up, you know, break apart the, the pores, they would all split right apart. So it's basically like a bunch of straws hanging down and all bunched together. Uh, this is what they call the beefsteak fungus. And if you were to cut this, it kind of looks like a tongue actually. If you were to cut this, it even has like marbling in the flesh. Um, this is one of the few that we say you can eat raw um, or cooked either way. Um, it actually has kind of a tart flavor. So it's, it's almost citrusy, um, not one of my favorites but um, others may like it. Any comments on that? I, I tried one for the first time this year. What'd you think? I liked it. Um, I found a recipe by Adam Harrington mm -hmm. and it, um, he said to marinate it in, I think it was vinegar. I forget now, but I marinated it overnight and he said it takes out some of that tartness, but it was really good. Um, one of the reasons I don't like this is, is to me, it has what I call the polypore taste. And if you're not certain of what that taste is, if you pick a Tremides versicolor, which is the turkey tail, or the true turkey tail, and kind of chew on it, it has that taste. 
And I find that this has that taste as well. I've even encountered that in uh, Hen of the Woods one time. Anyway, I guess it's something that has to be experienced to, to know, because I can't explain what it tastes like. I think Adam's um, recipe is balsamic vinegar and olive oil as a marinade. Yeah, that, nice. that's right. That's exactly it. And I, I let it soak. So I sliced it and then let it uh, marinate overnight. Ate it raw? No, no, I cooked it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I tried that recipe and I couldn't stand it. <laughs> do you like them? Do you like them plain? <laughs> it tasted like I was eating balsamic vinegar. Anyway. Well, yeah. D do you like them plain though? No, too tough. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Anyway, some people love these, so, you know, just you slice them and eat them right there. Can I All ask right. what the underside looks like for the beef steak? Um, I don't have an image of it, but it's, it's, it's pores. So it'll be white, kind of a white coloration, and it's just lots of little holes. So it Thanks. is a polypore. Yeah, it's not gilled. Um, so yeah, it's just a solid chunk, really. Um, and as I was saying, like the pores, if you were to kind of um, turn or uh, pull apart the, the underside, you'd see them kind of split apart. And if you look closely, they're, they're each, each one is a tube instead of all being attached. It's kind of neat. Typically polypores, they're all glommed together, embolites. All right, so we saw one of these before. This is the, this is probably more the summer variety of oyster mushrooms. Um, sometimes they can grow stem-like like this. Um, Populinus, I, I'm not sure um, exactly how to determine a couple of the, the white colored ones, but this is another oyster mushroom. All right, so we're on to Fred. This is a beautiful picture. Um, you guys know what that one is? We had a we had a similar lion's, lion's yeah. mane. That we had a very similar one at the at the monthly meeting, um, and if you remember, that one kind of had branches extending from it with the spines hanging off. This one's like a true pom pom and it, it's not branched. Um, it kind of, if you were to cut it, it is kind of branched. This is in very good shape. Um, it's pure white. Uh, it's got pretty long spines. Um, a lot of times if they're starting to turn brown or yellow, because this is a, a very good edible mushroom, um, if they're starting to turn brown or yellow, they can got to be kind of bitter. Uh, and I've encountered that before and it really, it really comes through. But if, they're, if you get a good one, they're delicious. Um, but yes, that's Herishium arenaceus. All right, so we just saw kind of a younger version of this. Uh, so this is maybe not very much older, but... Um, mm -mm. I'm eating up my ram, I guess. Um, but sometimes when the conditions start getting dry, they'll start looking very matte. So this is a, a, an older hen of the woods. And you can see it's much more mature. There's more brown coloration on the caps. Um, and like we were talking about, Maripolis, the brown usually doesn't go as far down and towards the base, it tends to have more yellow. And of course, the time of year. Um, and this is a good shot of the underside, it has fairly large pores. Um, they're, they're gonna be smaller than this when it's younger and as it gets older, the pores are gonna get, get larger. So yeah, that's another Griffola frondosa. 
All right, we're on to Isabella. Um, so I think at one of the monthly meetings, we had that weird dog nose fungus. I thought maybe it looked, was something like a small baby of this. Um, this is something that you'll find growing on oak trees. Um, it is a kind of polypore. Um, it used to be in Inonotus and they've moved it into pseudo Inonotus. And it doesn't always have as much resin drops on it. Um, but this is pseudo Inonotus dryadius. Dryadius? Sorry, I wanna, I, I always get the ends of names, dry, dryadius. I, I get the ends of names wrong sometimes. Um, but um, that's referring to what kind of tree it's growing on, you know, trees. This was a cool one, I thought. Um, I found this ages ago, and you guys are probably like, what is this little? It's very small. It probably looks bigger than what you can tell. There, each one is probably about the size of maybe a little BB. That you know, um, I found this years and years ago at Costco, and I didn't know what it was for the longest time. And I think I finally put it on iNaturalist, and somebody said, "Oh, that's the fenugreek stock ball," which is I, I knew I was going to forget, Fleogene, Fleogena faginia. Um, referring to where it was first found, which was on a beech tree. Um, I believe it can grow on other deciduous wood. Um, and if you take this and uh, apparently if you let it dry out a little bit, um, it'll start smelling kind of like fenugreek or, or like a curry. Um, pretty cool. Um, I didn't know if I would have ever gotten the ID on that one. So I natural can be very helpful sometimes. Um, I'm not sure that that's in any books that I, you know, not that I know of. All right. Um, this is another, uh, or this is, this kind of looks like a, a teeny little, I guess it's kind of hard to get the size of this. Um, but these are fairly small. Um, I don't know, Isabella, do you know around the, the size of those? Sorry, I was trying to unmute it. Basically a few millimeters, less than half a centimeter. I'm European. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> centimeters were better for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, quite, quite small. So that would kind of rule out, okay, you know, plus it's, it's, not as um, a clear color as something like an auricularia. Um, these are actually a little ascomycete. As Ascos corne, um, what was the, I, I think this may be sarcoides, but I, it, it looks like you need to get a microscope to actually determine what species it is. Um, but anyway, cool little cup fungi growing on wood. Um, all right. All right, on to Lena. I think you guys probably, most of you probably know what this is, huh? Anyway, it's a uh, chicken of the woods. It looks a little old and a little odd. Um, it almost looks like it has a fuzz growing on the top too. Um, and when she, so this is probably Latiparus Cincinnatus or Latiparus sulfurius. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, once she flipped the caps over, you could see instead of being a yellow color or a kind of tan color, they were actually orange. Lena, are you on? guess not, or maybe she's muted too. So she said that it covered all the entire everything, all the whole mushroom. And I know of one thing that may be able to do that, although I've never heard of it growing over the entire underside of a chicken of the woods. 
every time I've seen it, it's been on like a little like white cheese polypore or something, and it doesn't even cover the, the entire undersurface. So that I, you know, I don't know if I'm correct in my ID, but it's probably a hypomyces, which is a, a you know, like a mold that likes to eat other fungi. And um, orantius, so hypomyces orantius is this hypomyces that'll attack polypores and end up you know, turning the uh, pores orange like this. But like I said, I've never seen, I've never seen it cover a chicken of the woods like this. So that's, that's pretty darn cool. She said it was kind of fuzzy looking too. And some, you know, and so, so if you think of something like a lobster mushroom, so that's actually a russula or maybe a lactarius or, you know, but commonly it's like russula brevipes gets attacked by this other mold that feeds off of other fungi and it turns it this orange color. That's more of a red orange color. And most of the time these things are very specific in what they like to attack. Um, so I wouldn't call this a lobster, a chicken lobster or whatever. This is probably a totally different hypomyces. Um, but when it creates its spores, it makes little parathesia. She said she couldn't really see them, um, but usually they're kind of a pimply appearance um, when you look close. And that's where the, the spores are shot out. Um, they're, not, they're kind of asco mice -y. So anyway, I thought that was pretty darn cool. Um, I, I don't know if I'm right. If anybody encounters anything like this, let me know. So would you, you, yeah. you would, would you not harvest that? I would not harvest that because okay. it's, you know, we know that lobster mushrooms turn a, you know, subpar mushroom into a, you know, a much better mushroom. Um, but I don't know that enough is known about that hypothesis. If it's, you know, is it creating a toxin in there or, you know, I, I don't know enough about it. So if I found something like that, I, I certainly wouldn't eat it. Um, plus that chicken of the woods looks like it's getting a little old. So, and you know, you wanna be discernible when you're picking mushrooms out in the woods. It's like if you went into the grocery store, you wouldn't get your mushrooms, if you, you know, go to the mushroom aisle and, you know, some of them are starting to get slimy or something. You wouldn't pick those. You'd pick the good ones. You should probably, you should do that in the woods too. If it looks like, right. the, you know, try and pick the, the nice, fresh, you know, tender. Sometimes you're like, oh, darn, but it's just the luck of the draw. All right, I always enjoy finding these little guys. Um, they're not very common, at least from, uh, from my experience. And I, this is from Lisa. I, uh, oh, Lisa, you're on, aren't you? Yep. So um, I had sent you an email. Were there any pines or beech trees nearby? So, the lim it's um, Shenandoah and it's the Limberlost Trail. I don't know if you guys have hiked that trail, but there's a ton of hemlocks because I always go up there to find um, Suge. Oh. There's a ton of hemlocks there and I believe there are beech trees. Yes. Okay. Well, um, the fact that there's hemlocks there, that would definitely, you know, that's definitely a conifer. Um, but, but when I've found these, it's always been around conifers, but I've only found them a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't see any like pine duff. And I was like, hmm, I wonder, I wonder so if they grow. This, Go ahead. Th th there were two of them and it was towards the end of the trail, like where the near the parking area. And it was kind of like a little open space. And then there were trees, I can't remember exactly, but kind of surrounding it. And I, I, I've never seen a mushroom like that. I thought it was beautiful. Well, um, I, I have another one that I found recently. So, um, and you can see the, the cap and stuff better. So I'm, I was going to go into a little bit more detail when we got to that. But this is a, it, it's fairly um, unique. I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it has some features that make it stand out. Um, it was in its own 
genus. And after molecular studies, they've decided to pop it back into Cortinarius. And if you weren't aware, most people say, or they, they changed the edibility to Cortinarius to do not eat. Um, but you know, this was Rosites. Um, so, and it is a known edible and they're pretty tasty. I've actually eaten them before. This is what they call the gypsy, gypsy mushrooms. So this is Rosites caparata, um, or actually now it's Cortinarius caparata. Anyway, I, I have another image of this and I can, I'll talk about some of the features on that one. But um, roots of trees can travel quite far. So just because there's no pine duff here, doesn't, if there were some hemlocks around, that doesn't mean that the roots, because this is mycorrhizal, doesn't mean that the roots um, haven't traveled out this far and it's growing off of those. All right. I don't know what to tell you about this one, Lisa. <laughs> um, so I, I actually you, sent you a picture of the spore print I took. I, Did I, you? I did. I saw it. I didn't. I didn't. It wouldn't have fit in the one image, so I didn't. Get, I didn't uh, put that on there. But it, it looked so brown you, to me. Yep, it's a rusty brown, really, really dark rusty brown. So I kind of messed up when I thought it was a brick cap, but it, oh, it's that's not. okay. I mean, that's why we do this, right? Right. Um. So oh, so it, it looked just brown, brown. But but anyway, considering it has um, it has some scaliness here. And it looks like it's growing from this wood um, and the brown, rusty brown spore. I would probably put this in foliota. Um, okay. So um, Lisa was saying, hey, I, this might be a brick cap. And there are, you know, this is a little oranger than brick cap. Brick caps are usually more of a red color, but there's another hypholoma, which is what the genus of the brick caps are. Um, that, that's more orange. They have one that's uh, Hypholoma capnoides. Um, but if you're finding Hypholoma, they're going to have more of a purpley brown spore print. Um, Got it. So, so that's, that's actually a, you know, taking a spore print, if, especially if you're not sure, even if you are kind of sure, and you're, or, you, or even if you're questioning, getting a spore print can sometimes help lead you in the right direction or at least prove you right or wrong. Um, so anyway, this is probably a foliota. I can't tell you what species. If anybody has any suggestions about if they think it's a specific foliota, feel free to chime in. So, but that's a good example of, of using spore print to try and figure out what your mushroom is. Especially if you don't know what it is, it's really good to get a spore print because all the field guides will tell you what um, what the spore color is. When it comes to russula, that's a, it's a different story because they have a gradation of color, and sometimes it might be hard to like, oh, is it this or is it that? But that's another that's a whole other thing. So um, I'm naturalist. When I did a little further research, search, it's saying it could be foliota spumosa. Did I say that right? Maybe, I don't know that one. So I, I couldn't tell you if it's right or wrong. Okay. But um, I mean, that's, that's another good thing about iNaturals because it might give you a suggestion and at least like, you know, sometimes you'll find a mushroom and go like, what the heck is that? And, mm -hmm. and it might not even like, it, as you get better at learning things, sometimes you can look at them and, and you learn a few features to where you can at least get it to genus. You know, and if you get to genus, at least you can kind of look through there and and try and whether it's a key or, or you know, just looking at different features, you can kind of weed it out and maybe get to the right answer. Um, and but if you aren't able to do that, something like a tool like iNaturalist, it'll at least give you a suggestion and you'll say, oh, foliota. OK, let me look into those and then you can do further research on that. and. And see so, if, so the foliotas have have the rust. Do they all have the rusty spore print? Yeah, they have. They have like a brown, usually okay. rusty, brown to rusty brown. 
whereas the, the hypholomas tend to be more of a purple, have some sort of purple hue to them. And there's a few of those, like the brick caps. Um, you've got your, um, the uh, sublaterish, or yes, no, that's the brick caps. Um, fasciculare, which is a yellowish one. And when you look at its gills, they, it almost has a greenish hue. Mm -hmm. But over time, it'll start getting that purple coloration to it from the spores maturing. Um, okay, Matt. All right, so Matt's gonna kind of. We got a couple here that Matt submitted. He's gonna he's gonna tell us about these. Okay. Um, so I've been seeing a lot of these in section of Rock Creek Park, Ischnoderma resinosum, the resinous polypore, and um, these are nice and young and tender and just starting to erupt from the logs. Um, and you can see the cool little droplets on it, kind of like the, uh, so the Indonotus dryadius. Um, so that's kind of a neat feature. And then as they get bigger, they get tougher. Um, so these guys are probably around three, two, three inches um, projecting out from the log. And they'll probably get up to like around six, eight inches or so, and they get tough and and hard at later on. But when they're young like this, um, I was googling around and looking for recipes, and I had cooked this up last year. I think I found the same recipes I the same recipe I had found last year. Um, but I uh, cooked these guys up, and like the black staining polypore, they turn totally black. But they're actually Ooh. a very very tasty mushroom. So I don't know if anyone, has anyone ever had the resinous polypore? Has anyone ever cooked it up? I haven't, no. Yeah. So anyway, that they're, they're kind of erupting all over the place where I was. It's something to be looking out for. They tend to be quite sticky when you first find them, right? Um, They're kind of mushy. No, no, like if you were to touch where you cut it, it I thought they were kind of sticky. It's been a while since I've I've messed with them. Yeah, I mean, you would think from resinous that it would be sticky, but I don't, re I don't recall it being particularly sticky. Even not, I, I don't mean the resin. I mean the like the flesh. Yeah, I mean I'm, to your hand. You mean to your hands? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't recall that. Maybe I'm thinking of something different. Yeah, no. So that was interesting. I can you can go to the next one. Sort of got the texture of like dough before you know, like bread dough before it's cooked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so blue, it's always skis me out every year. I kind of have to. <laughs> I'm always like, I think that's a blue, it, but I'm not sure. And um, so, so in the upper left is not a blue, it, and I label these guys. Um, so it's some quaternary species. I didn't take the time to figure it out. Do you know what it is, Mitch? I mean, it could be something like out. There's, there's quite a few of these purpley ones. They, you know, like albovilaceous and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's what, when you read up on the quaternary, that people mistake for bluet albovilaceous is the one that comes up. Um, but I labeled, you know, it has a typical quaternary veil on there in the upper left corner. You can see that it's kind of a cobwebby veil covering the cap that hasn't fully expanded yet there you go you can really see it parts of it yeah too. yeah it was real nice that was a real nice example of that and um and then it has that shape of a blue it though and the purple tones of it too that you'll see um if you zoom back out yes um one thing is it's it's almost silky. A lot of times the 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 quaternarias have that silky look to them, like this little shiny. Uh -huh. you know. So a lot of times they'll um, they'll be shiny like that. Not all of them. That that cap that's fully expanded. I don't, I'm not really picking that up. Um, so the bluets I was finding, you know, the top sides, some of them are kind of blue, but most of them were kind of washed out. But then the undersides were. Most of them were, were very bluish. And then I took them back home and in the bottom left, I just have a comparison of the two of them, profile view. And then the bottom right, I have the spore print. So again, going back to spore print, that's 
the you know that's the um, that's a telltale. So rusty the court brown has that rusty. Yeah, not a court, not a blue it. <laughs> right, and the blue it has the white spore print. And this is this is on flagstone in my on my back porch. So <laughs> it's not it's not a totally neutral color, but um, background, but it it gives you the idea. So that uh yeah, so I always feel like when I see blue, it's like. I just got to be sure because like the Cortinarius one is fully expanded and that cobweb veil has gone away. I mean, they do have that rusty spore starting to develop in the gills. But um, anyway, just something to, I thought it was a good illustration of the comparison of the two. Definitely. And, and you know, I, I find like that, that, that shininess, even though it's not shiny here, uh -huh. there's, it's still like um, fibrils on the cap. Like it's, it's, threads or like, you know, if it, it, it kind of has a look to it. Um, and usually if you get them, they're usually around this size or, you know, this age. And you can usually see some sort of rustiness developing. Yeah. And whereas blue, it's there, they all remain that violet color. There, there is um, a field blue too. So there's a couple different types type of blue it. And one of them is much paler. So even though this one's um, this one's faded on top and still colored on the bottom, there are some that will also be pale underside too. I found a couple um, that I thought were bluets too, and since I'm not very too familiar, I've never tried a bluet, but I did a spore print and they turned out to be quaternaries. So. <laughs> Exact same hey, thing you, happened. I, I saw a group of them and they, I was like, oh, I think these are bluets and the color was beautiful and took them home and nope. Yeah, we'll see, that's good. I, you, you know to take a spore print, which is, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's good in itself. That's cool. And it, if anybody's curious, Cortinarius can be quite toxic. Um, they have a uh, orelanine in them and it's a very strange thing and you may not be sick then, but maybe a couple of weeks later or something, your kidneys start failing. Mm. And, and so, yeah, it, 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 it'll mess you up the, I don't know what his name is, the guy who wrote the horse whisperer. Apparently, you know, they, you know, they were kind of feeding off of each other. Like, yeah, yeah, you, you know, a blue, it's had a, yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, yeah, you know, and they kind of fed off of each other and then they went and they just thought they had a little bit of false confidence and accidentally, you know, ate some cortinarius and messed themselves up. Wow. So yeah, it is very good to be careful when you're when you're looking for bluets. Okay. Okay. That's a beautiful shot, Matt. <laughs> so uh, this is another good fall edible. Um, yeah, there was an amazing explosion of, of these around a um, dying, or is actually a dead ash tree. And um, yeah, there are literally probably a thousand of uh, between of caps and the other form of this. So this is the aborted entoloma and a uh, nice illustration of both the aborted form and the non-aborted stalk and cap and gills and I got one turned over there in the front center you know what's funny is looking at these they kind of look like those fleogena fenugreek stock balls <laughs> oh really <laughs> I mean the scale well, this, yeah it's the scale but like look at them little, anyway sorry yeah 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 <laughs> these are these are quite large <laughs> right yep um yeah so I, I go, go into what's going on here as far as so you got the the cap and the stalk with the gills, the regular normal looking mushroom there is the Entoloma aborvitum. And then the aborted Entoloma was named the aborted Entoloma when they thought that the honey mushroom, our malaria species, was causing the mushroom to, to not fully form or not full, form properly. And then later, more recently, um, mycologists have determined that the 
aborted form is actually the entoloma parasitizing the honey mushroom. So I think that's still current. I don't know if that's as changed. far as I know. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's also known as shrimp of the woods, the aborted form, and um, both both of them. You know, I cooked up a bunch of these, and the both both forms are are good to eat. And I, uh, you know, the non-aborted form is one I don't think I've ever seen it on its own, at least that I'm not aware of. But that would be kind of a tricky mushroom to identify without. It would, and, and you know, form nearby. And we, you know, caution against eating entolomas because there are some that yeah. will really mess up your stomach. Um, right, right. And the I don't have any. There was a couple caps that were overlapping each other out there in the field, and I guess I didn't include that in here. But they have a pinkish mm. cast to their spore print. Then, oh, um, the um, the cap when you yeah, yeah. when you take a. Michael E's pink, like that fleshy color. Yep. Which is typical for entolomas. Um, so yeah, so each of these little white cushiony things would have been a honey mushroom. And sometimes you'll actually find the honey mushrooms popping up in here that haven't gotten aborted. So you sometimes you find all three. You can kind of see where this one, like that's probably what would have been the cap. I mean, the stipe of a mushroom, but it got aborted by these entolomas. Yeah, and there was a bunch of um, honey mushrooms nearby, uh, kind of probably about 50 feet away or so, the ones that it seemed like the entoloma had not reached out to. Mm -hmm. And on the periphery, there were a bunch of honey mushrooms. So it was, uh, looked like Armillaria, uh, is it Gallica? Um, the one with the cobwebby veil and the darker color mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, these cooked up really nicely, put them in butter and garlic, fried them up, and they made a real nice, uh, throw some salt in there, and then made a real nice shrimp, shrimpy um, kind of imitation shrimp of um, shrimp dish, and um, put a little Old Bay, dip them in a little Old Bay, it's even better. <laughs> yeah. And the, but the cap, the cap in the stock form is, is good too kind of a whole different thing so it's kind of like two mushrooms in one well cool yeah so anyway and they they have a very about it in a few places yeah they have a very distinct if you haven't found these before if you do um and nothing else looks like these aborted forms there's nothing else you'll see out there that looks like that and if you give them a, a whiff they have a very particular smell um some people say it's kind of cucumbery um but it's very particular to these and the, the, the interloma mushrooms themselves also have that smell. So. so the one thing you, well, two things you could confuse them for, I was leading a walk this weekend and I uh, actually did find a false shrimp of the woods, packing really? peanut, packing <laughs> peanuts. That's why they look just like them. Cause you know, usually when you see these, you see them more scattered about, you don't see them so dense as they are in this right. picture. So you just see like a few of the little aborted entolomas. And then we came across a bunch of packing peanuts somewhere in the woods. And sure enough, someone's like, oh, there's some more aborted entolomas. I said, I think that's a false end. Uh, right, entoloma. yeah. Sure enough. Hopefully people would be able to, would be able to yeah. identify the two though. Yeah, not very pleasant meal. Um, <laughs> And they, um, I mean, I guess another thing, if you saw one of these individually, you could confuse it for like a weird puffball, you know, kind of a, if you had a very regular aborted entoloma and a more irregular puffball, you might confuse it too. So. But if you cut the puffball in half and you yeah. cut the entoloma in half, they'll, you'll see like the typically you know, puffballs are in the tissue of the entoloma versus the puffball if it's a young yeah. one. Pretty uniform. Puffballs tend to be much more uh, uniform in shape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, than these. Yeah. But no, that's a great picture, though. Cool. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. So we already saw one of these. Um, this one doesn't have the scaliness um, or what looked like the scales as 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 a, a prominent on the cap here a little bit where you can see that cap cuticle kind of tearing apart there. Um, but I believe these are a another Gymnopolis, Junonius. 
And you can see the older ones are starting to have their spores mature. So you can see the, the change in gill coloration there as they get older. These were around the other side of the tree. All right, back to the gypsy. So um, I was waiting to kind of describe this since I got a, a top shot of this one. Um, they would call this a bloom. And it's, it's pretty much on every gypsy you're gonna find. And it's this kind of whitish, sometimes it even almost has a purplish pinkish hue to it and can be very distinct. Um, and so if you find a mushroom that looks like that, has a ring, um, kind of notched gills, the gills start out a white coloration, but then they're eventually going to get that kind of brown, rusty brown spore print looking color. Um, then you've probably got a gypsy. Um, as I was saying, they typically grow in, around conifer, but uh, once I read up, apparently they can grow around beach as well. Um, a lot of times they'll get this kind of corrugated cap too, where you get these little wrinkles happening all across the cap. And sometimes they fruit in abundance too. Like if they do come up and the conditions are right, they can cut, a lot of them will come up at once. And they are pretty tasty. Mitch, there are other, uh, there are other Cortinaries lookalikes that we've got to be aware of uh, for um, these. I, I don't know that they have that particular bloom. There might be some yellowish quartz, um, but if you put all those uh, characteristics together with this, I'm pointing with my hands again, with um, the, uh, the wrinkly type cap with this bloom and the ring, um, I was concerned when I first found them. I, when I first found them, I was relatively new to the club and they were, I mean, I'd never seen as many mushrooms growing in an area. There was brand new babies, mature ones, rotting ones. And they were, there was, you know, 20 in every cluster and they were just football fields full of them. They were everywhere. <laughs> and um, okay. That concern was well founded. You're eating the one edible Cortinarius. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but, um, but um, I didn't know what they were. And so I, um, I picked them and I cooked them. And then I went on a trip and I didn't freeze them and they went bad. Um, but the next time I found them, um, I tried them and they were good. But how, how, how big does that cap get? I mean, they on can get, they can get, uh, I don't know, six inches, maybe, um, you know, some of the smaller ones might just be a couple few inches. These are pretty um, substantial mushrooms. They're not, they're not too small. I didn't put mm -hmm. my knife down next to them or anything to, to kind of give you a scale, but they can be relatively large. This was probably maybe a um, four or five inch cap across. Um, and you can see this, this stipe is pretty substantial as well, and, and it's not too tough either. Um, and do you normally get what looks like a regular annulus instead of a cortina with these? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to get more of a ring. Um, uh, sometimes it can leave uh, remnants on the, the cap, uh, the, the margin of the cap. Um, but yeah, this one, this one is more of a, more of a membranous ring than a Cortina. Fun to find. I, I think they're pretty mushrooms and that bloom is like really neat looking to me. There are a couple, there are some russulas that'll also have that bloom. Um, but as far as I know, for Cortinarius, this would be the only one. I may be mistaken then. All right, so this is the one that I was confused about earlier, the, um, with the purple gills. Uh, they tend to have very thick kind of waxy gills. Um, this is kind of typical of Lacaria. Uh, so if you find something like this, it's, 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 
it's a good, um, you probably have something like Alicaria. You'll notice on this one, it has very similar features on the stipe as that other one. Um, the cap color is very, is extremely variable. Um, so it can be from brown to all the way to white after it gets washed out. Um, but this was, th these were growing in kind of a lawn type area with some oak trees around. Um, but this is the uh, Lacaria ochre purpurea again. Often this, um, this depression in the center is, is present as well, not always. And they can flatten out to plain, to down all the way to enrolled a bit. So they're, they, they're a variable mushroom, but when you look at the underside, and, and it's kind of cool that you, you might see this nondescript kind of tan, oh, I wonder what that is, and you turn it over and you got these beautiful purple gills. I always like finding this one. Of course, it's that. I like purple, so. All right, this is a pretty cool one. It may not look very appetizing, which it isn't, but um, this is a mushroom that is actually growing. And I, I purposely got these little woolly aphids up here. I don't know if you guys have ever seen woolly aphids before, but if you've ever been walking in beech woods and sometimes you'll see a weird uh, uh, like coating on the leaves underneath. Sometimes you'll see these black blob things growing on it. Sometimes you don't. But these woolly aphids are, you know, drinking the sap of this beech tree and they're pooping and their poop drops down onto the bark and onto the branches below. And this fungus is actually growing on the honeydew of the aphids. Um, this one is fairly young as it is not completely black. It also has some of the yellow coloration, but eventually it'll all turn completely black. And if you haven't seen those little woolly aphids, they're, they're kind of cool. So if you're walking in beech woods around this time of year, keep an eye open. And if you see these white little fuzzy things, you can just kind of walk up and you'll see them all like flicking their tail. They're all kind of like doing a little dance or something. They're, they're really neat looking. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a defensive maneuver and you have to really admire a, an organism that dances in the face of danger. <laughs> 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 so, so this is Scoria spongiosa, and it, it's pretty soft, um, and it's kind of a little gelatinous. Um, just, it's a fun one to find for me, anyway. Um, um, it, I also wanted to give an aside on the uh, sure. okra pur purpurea. Oh, okay. uh, I've actually eaten that before, and, um, and uh, even though it's not of itself a flavorful mushroom, um, it is, it has really good texture and it's a superb conveyance of whatever you cook it with. So if butter and garlic is your thing, uh, you know, that's, it, it's really good carrier for the other flavors that you put in a dish with it. Cool. And as I was mentioning before, I think I, I, I mentioned the other one has forked gills. And if you look here, none of these are forked. They're all, they all seem to be singular. Anyway, so I don't know what's going on with that other one. I guess it's possible it could be some different species of Lacaria. Ah, this is the one, I actually found this today. This is my front yard and I've never seen it there before. I found a couple of different mushrooms in my yard this year that I had never seen. Um, so I believe this is a tricholoma. Uh, tricholoma a lot of times will have a partial veil, a ring left on, this, on the stipe. Um, this one doesn't happen to have that. Um, there are a few that have these yellow, yellow colorations, um, but I believe one of, the, one of the main things that helped me get to the species was this dark, this dark fibrils on the cap of this one, especially. There was some on the cap of the other as well. And you can see them in the center here. 
I believe this is tricholoma sejunctum. Um, we usually don't see too many tricholomas in this area, at least from my experience. Um, but I think I might have had a tricholoma caligatum out there as well. It's kind of buried in the moss. I didn't get a picture of that one. And it can look similar to Magna Valere, which is the one that um, is a choice edible, especially in Japan, they love it. Um, and if you smell it, it has kind of a, well, some people might say red hots and then other people might say dirty socks. So it kind of has this weird combination of aromas. Um, Caligatum apparently has no smell. I've, I've found it in the past, and it, but it can look very similar. The uh, Trichloma magna lavere, the American masitake, Mm -hmm. uh, I've had that before. That is a superb edible, but I think at a DC area, the only place you're going to be able to buy it is at H Mart and mm -hmm. only there on a rare occasion. <laughs> right. Yeah, it doesn't grow in our area. All right. This one was submitted by Nancy. Uh, this, um, if you remember that uh, Cupronopsis atramentaria that we saw earlier, this is probably in the same genus. It has kind of like this conical shape, um, not necessarily that kind of egg shape, but you can see it's kind of curving down, but um, this is in the same group as, it's one of the Inkies. Um, and so something like Cupernus comatus, which is a good edible, um, but I don't think that that's what this is. Um, Nancy, do you happen to be on today? I guess not. Um, I think this actually may be one that, I don't know, um, there's quite a few um, inky caps, and I certainly don't know them all, um, but there is one that looks similar to this. I think the, the, these fiber or the patches on the cap are usually more impressed onto the cap in the one I was thinking it might be, but this might be um, uh, Cupernopsis picacia, and they call it the magpie. And one thing I was going to ask Nancy if she was on, if she, if she was near them, if you give those a smell, they almost have like a tar-like smell. So certainly nothing you would want to eat if you smelled it. Um, but I, I thought that may be what this is, um, but not certain. Another one of the inky caps. All right, and I think this is the last one sent in by Ross. Um, what, what did you call that inky cap? What was the species? Um, Cupernopsis picacia. Okay. Thanks. They call it like the magpie caprinus or the magpie inky or something like that. Um, and I have found them fresh and quite a few of them in the past. And if you smell them, they do have this weird aroma, kind of tar. Very strange. And so I think a lot of folks have seen something like this happen. Um, this is one of the puff balls growing in abundance. Um, this is Lycoperdon pyroforme. Um, this is a very classic example. They kind of grow smushed right up against each other. These are probably getting a little bit older because you can see these like fibers on the apical pore are it looks like they might be getting ready to pop. So the way the puff balls uh, distribute their spores is the whole inside of this is filled with what they call a gleba. And as that matures over time, this little apical pore um, kind of dissolves away. And when the raindrops hit it, um, that, that gleba turns powdery and it puffs out. And so that's how they distribute their spores. Um, puff balls can be, are edible. Um, I think if some people like them. Um, I'm not too big of a fan myself, um, but it's always fun to find a big cluster of, thing of, of them growing like this. And a lot of times you'll see these throughout the year. Um, except they're gonna be kind of flattened out. So the outer shell will kind of remain and not um, decay away over time. 
And so, you know, into the winter, you'll see these flattened out things all over some logs and stuff like this. It's just the, the remnants of the, of the, the shell after they distribute all their spores. I believe that was the last one that I had. Um, I think those have been moved to the genus Apioperdon. Really? Yeah. Yep, I think that's the last one I had. Of course. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I hadn't heard that one. Where, where, uh, is that, um, did, where'd you hear that? Or you read that in the books or online? Just typed it in the chat. I think that's what it's called now. Okay. Cool. Um, I hadn't hey, seen you that. Know, every other day, something changes its name now. Uh, so. Yeah, it, it's it's almost gotten to where common names um, can sometimes be more helpful than than the name than the uh, scientific names these days because they're changing everything. Um, the mushroom stays the same. Anyway, thanks everybody. Um, thanks for your submissions. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, like I was saying, I, I might change to where we can submit two pictures. That way we can take like, you know, a top shot and then a flipped over shot and I can just, you know, glue them together. And that way we'd have both views of the same mushroom. Um, so we might do that a little bit more in the future. So that's something to think about if you want to um, submit more pictures. Any um, questions or comments or? No? Thank you, Mitch. Sure, no problem. Thank you, this is great. Cool, I appreciate it. You guys have a good one. You Thanks, too, Mitch. thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good one. Thanks again. Hey, thanks a whole lot. I sure enjoyed listening in. Great. Appreciate it. Take care. <laughs>